Hey, today I want to comment on a video by Dr. Oz where his guest was a health guru who eats 5,000 calories of junk food and claims he's still healthy. Coming right up. Hey, I'm Dr. Eckberg with Wellness for Life and if you'd like to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure that you subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss anything. So I found a video on Dr. Oz's channel that was uh, curious to say the least, but quite disturbing actually. And I, I read some of the comments and they were all saying that, yeah, this is how you lose weight, but no one really questioned the quality of food or if this was a healthy thing. So Dr. Oz asked two questions in the beginning. He asked, how can you eat 5,000 calories a day and still lose weight? And then he asked also, is this even healthy? So we're going to answer those two questions because they, even though we asked the questions, he didn't really answer them in the video. So weight is about insulin resistance primarily. There are multiple reasons why you could gain weight, but the primary reason is insulin resistance. Insulin is a hormone that helps your body take sugar from the bloodstream and into the cells. So when you have, when you eat sugar or carbohydrates, your blood sugar goes up and insulin is necessary to move that sugar into the bloodstream. Once we get into a modern lifestyle and eat lots and lots of meals that are high in carb, now every time that we eat something, it's a signal for the body to store fat, to take the sugar out of the bloodstream, put it into the cell where the cell converts it to fat. And if we eat six times a day, then we're reminding, we're telling the body six times a day to store fat. What he does was this guy called Blake, what he does properly, and this is kind of what this is all about, he does, what, does what's called intermittent fasting or one meal a day. So this does a couple of things. First of all, if you only eat one meal a day, you're only telling the body to store fat once, right? Instead of six times, that's a good thing. And if you eat one huge meal, then your body can only absorb that so fast. If you put in six to eight pounds of food like this guy does, the body can't absorb it all in 30 minutes and put it in the bloodstream. It's going to kind of seep out gradually even if there's a lot of sugar and carbohydrate in there because the body just can't get to it that fast. That's very different from eating sugar by itself or drinking something like a soda because if you have a soda on an empty stomach, there's nothing else to slow down the absorption of that sugar. The sugar is already liquefied, it's ready for absorption and it's in your bloodstream almost instantly. If you eat a huge meal, it's going to slow down absorption. The other thing that happens if you eat one meal is the body is really, really good at adapting. So if you eat six meals a day, your body gets dependent on six meals a day. It gets used to it. It says, okay, it's been two, three hours since you ate. Give me something new. Again, give me, give me some more food. I'm hungry again. But if you teach your body, if you give it the expectation that it's only going to get food once a day, now it actually doesn't expect food that often and all of the food that you stored from last night, your body can now retrieve it. So once your body gets used to that one meal a day, that also reduces the insulin resistance because the body learned how to retrieve that, those calories, that energy from what you ate in that huge meal. And as a consequence, and he's absolutely right in this, is once you get used to one meal a day, you don't get hungry the rest of the time because the body learns how to deal with that. It learns how to pull from the stores. The second thing that works in favor of this guy is he is very active. And activity does two things. And the one that they focus on here is that it burns energy. That's true. But the one thing that it's even more important that activity does, physical activity, reduces insulin resistance. Once you move, then that cell membrane, the insulin receptor becomes more sensitive. It's more likely to let that sugar through with a very small amount of insulin. 
So moving in itself, not the calories, but the movement, the fact that you're activating a muscle, you're increasing circulation in your body, actually reduces insulin resistance. It increases insulin sensitivity. It changes the properties of those receptors. So that's physiology. And this, these two things explain why someone might be able to get away with eating a very large amount of food. The third thing that works in favor of him is he's young. He started this when he was about 30, so he wasn't broken yet. Okay? He hadn't lost his carbohydrate tolerance. So if you think of all the, bo the body organs as uh, parts of a machine that has a job, they do different things, and as long as they have a certain capacity to perform their work, let's say it's at least above 50%, then you're not going to have any symptoms. The work will go on. They can keep up. It's not broken yet. And carbohydrate tolerance is like a machine that has to process and take care of these things that you put in your body. So carbohydrates are a stress on the body. It has to adapt. It has to make insulin. It has to store it. It's an extra step. It's a little bit of a burden. But if you're reasonably young and not broken yet, your body can get can, can take care of it. You can get by. So that explains the first question. How can you eat 5,000 calories and still lose weight? And I myself is an example of this because when I was an Olympic athlete and I was training five, six hours a day, I ate probably five, six, seven thousand 7,000 calories a day. And a lot of it was sugar and candy and cereal and ice cream and bread and on and on and on. And I had 3% body fat. So sure, there's lots and lots of people, uh, especially young people, who can get by with this. So here's the next question. And this is where everyone misses the point. Is it healthy? And we really have to change our entire perspective on health because we're getting really, really sick as a nation and we're getting really, really fat as a nation and therefore we say, oh, fat must cause the disease and that nothing could be further from the truth. Even though a fat person is not healthy, that doesn't mean that it's the fat that caused the problem. It's the other way around. There's all sorts of health issues. There's all sorts of imbalances that lead to the disease, to various diseases, and to the fat gain. It doesn't mean there's a causative relationship from the fat to the disease. And this is where we need to rethink these. So some examples that can you have high blood pressure and be lean? Absolutely. Can you have autoimmune disease and be lean? Of course you can. So obese people have more of these problems like blood pressure, autoimmunity, diabetes, IBS, cancer, dementia, liver failure, etc. But there's lots and lots of lean people who have these also. So these are not the cause of the, of the uh, obesity and vice versa. The obesity is just one more consequence of having deficiencies and imbalances. What's the problem with the video? Because here's a guy who was 60 pounds overweight and he started eating like this and he lost the weight. So because most people are, don't understand the, that lean is not healthy, that that's not necessarily uh, synonymous, they give this guy a lot of credibility. I mean, he's an example. He did this. He has life experience. So the problem is he basically did a case study with a sample size of one. That means there was one person himself and it worked for him. That doesn't mean it's a good idea or that it's a good idea for anybody else. So I went and looked at his website and uh, or his uh, YouTube channel rather and all the thumbnails I looked at a few I, I listened to one of his explanations that really didn't have much uh, common sense or or physiology or any sort of knowledge in it but it was his experience so I can't blame him and most of those videos most of those meals he eats once a day or in a four-hour window that he says 
He eats four to five hundred grams of carbohydrates and most of the meals are high in sugar. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the video titles talk about M&Ms and chocolates and candy and, and this and that, uh, donuts, cookies, and most of those, they're very high in sugar. They're mostly processed flours. Almost every meal has bread and pizza and buns and donuts and cookies in them. And I didn't check a whole bunch of videos, but one, someone asked if the syrup on the pancakes was sugar or sugar-free, and he proudly said it was sugar-free. And that means it has aspartame and sucralose in it, which, has, which are neurotoxins. So if you want to learn more about uh, artificial sweeteners and neurotoxins, you can check out this video right here. The problem with this is that these are not healthy foods. You can get by, you, your body can cope with a lot of things for years, even decades, but it doesn't mean it's healthy. It just hasn't caught up with you yet. And high sugar, sugar and processed flours do not have nutrients in them. They say in the Dr. Oz video that, oh, I make sure I count all my calories and I count all my nutrients, I make sure I get all of them. No, you can't because the nutrients aren't in the sugar, the nutrients aren't in the processed flour. You are depleting your body of nutrients if you eat that way. Sure, you can stay lean for many, many years, maybe forever. Can you be healthy? No, because you're missing nutrients. You're not eating real food the way that nature made it. And then he did this case study of one. He includes his girlfriend and says, oh, look, we're both lean. Uh, and then he gets testimonials from people who have success with his method. And of course, if you have, if it's going to work for 50% and not work for 50%, he's going to get the testimonials from the people it works for. And again, the, the key word is, does it work? Well, it helps people lose weight. Does it help them get healthy? Of course not. Because he's not basing this on clinical experience. He doesn't have an office where thousands of people come, thr come through and he has to deal with autoimmunity and diabetes and digestive problems and Crohn's disease and, and trying to turn those around. If you tried this diet with any of those conditions, then you would be very likely to screw that person up very, very seriously. Then you're saying, but wait, Dr. Oz asked, is this healthy? And then he tested him. They did blood work. They checked him out. Uh, and Dr. Oz stated that all the values were in the optimal range. So glucose, fasting glucose was 84. That's optimal. That is what you're going to get pretty much if you're not terribly insulin resistant and you do intermittent fasting for a good bit, then you're going to end up around 80 to 85. That's a very good value. That means it's not very insulin resistant. Then they went on to cholesterol and they said, drum roll, a normal, a, a healthy cholesterol is less than 200. And then they had the drum roll and they looked at it and go 118. And they both went like, oh, that's so amazing. That's so good. Because in mainstream medicine, cholesterol is seen as a problem and therefore less is always better. If they had found three, they'd be even more impressed. Here's the problem. Cholesterol is a necessary nutrient. It is the second after fish oil, after DHA, cholesterol is the main component of your brain. It is the insulation of your nerves. It's what makes the nerves able to conduct signals. It is what gives your cell membranes. You have a hundred trillion cells. They do a job. They decide what goes in and out of a cell. That's how the body organizes itself. Cholesterol is a crucial component in making this work, in preserving the signal properties of that membrane. In functional medicine, they say that 
a healthy and optimal cholesterol and functional medicine are medical doctors and, and holistically minded people uh, who look at the blood work a little differently and they say that a healthy cholesterol is between 200 and 140 and a cholesterol of 118 would be a red flag. That means we think there may be something seriously wrong here and I would be very, very concerned. They have found that of people above age 80, the ones who have the best mental function have cholesterols of 220 to 240. So higher cholesterol reduces the risk or is associated, is correlated with a reduced risk of dementia. And people in higher ages with lower cholesterol have a dramatically increased rate of dementia. And when you get as low as 118, I'd be seriously concerned. So I'm not going to diagnose the guy with anything because that's not what we do, but this would worry me tremendously. So we have to change how we think about health. When they ask healthy, that just means it hasn't developed into a disease yet in, in their frame of mind. We want to think about health more like a dimmer switch. So you can have a light on at 100% and then if you turn the dimmer down, let's say you're reading something and you're reading it fine at 100% and then you turn the dimmer down to 50 and now you start squinting a little bit but you can still make it out. But then you turn it down to 25 and now you can't read the thing anymore. That's how your health is as well. So think about health as a dimmer switch. Think about it as an amount of function, as an amount of resources in the body that make everything balanced, that make everything function. And let's say that you're starting at 100% at your optimum point in life, then if the dimmer goes down, which it will with age, but it goes down so slowly that you don't get down to 40-50% where disease typically develops. Uh, and these are not absolute numbers, these are just sort of examples to give you an idea how this, this works. You could get to the end of your life without developing diseases. You could live to 100 or beyond and not develop a disease if you have enough functional capacity, if your dimmer switch hasn't gone so low yet. Uh, someone else could be less lucky. They may not ever get to 100. Their genetic makeup, uh, their development in utero may not have been that favorable, so they may have started out at a lower level but if they take care of themselves, if they stead, continuously provide nutrients, they take care of themselves, they get exercise, they have low stress, then they can also make it to the end of their life without developing a disease. Whereas someone who really abuses their body and has a steep decline, someone who wastes resources, someone who eats high sugar, processed flour, chemical laden food, neurotoxins, someone who has a cholesterol of 118, they might be going at this rate and they might get sick and, and die long before their, their natural lifespan and yet they could be at age 30, 35, 40 and have no symptoms and be very fit and get, get away with all kinds of things. So we got to look at this from a bigger perspective. We have to start understanding, instead of asking the question, how do we lose weight? We have to start asking questions, how do we obtain the optimum health? How do we maintain the balance? What is required for a healthy body? How do we live in balance with nature and our environment? What is our natural environment? If we start asking questions like this, we'll get much better answers than if we just ask, how do I lose weight? Okay. I hope this was informative and helpful. I made this video because I want to straighten out these misconceptions. When people think that it's all about weight, they're, they're mistaken because there's lots and lots of ways to lose weight and be unhealthy. Please share this video with as many people as you can because we have to get this 
real, there's scientific information out there, the information that's based on physiology and clinical experience, not on symptom treatment and anecdotal evidence. So share your comments below and let, ask any questions. Let me know if there's anything else on these topics that you'd like to know more about or if there's anything else you'd like to explain in, in more detail. And I'd be more than happy to try to do that. So thanks for watching.